My name is Bethany Bell, and it's a very great pleasure for me to begin by introducing Ray Monk, Professor of Philosophy at Southampton University. And I think it's perhaps not unfair to say that Ludwig Wittgenstein changed your life. Um, Or more or less is my life. (laughs) Um, You studied uh, philosophy at uh, the University of York. You went on to study uh, graduate studies at Oxford universities where you looked at Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics. Uh, And it was there that you came up with the idea of writing about Wittgenstein's life Mm. so that you didn't just consider his ideas in isolation. And that then led to a biography, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, The Duty of Genius, which was a runaway success <laughs> and got, many, uh, got uh, the uh, John Llewellyn uh, Rees Prize. And from then on, that led to a teaching position at Southampton University and a professorship. And uh, you went on to write on more books about mm-hmm. Wittgenstein and Bertrand Russell, Robert Oppenheimer, and it is a very great pleasure uh, for you to be with, here with us this evening. Thank and you, thank you very much. <laughs> one of the things that I think is curiously symbolic about tonight, it's the 11th of November, which is, of course, the anniversary of the armistice in 1918 on the Western Front, and from an Austrian perspective, it's the day that the last emperor, Karl, renounced all his say in Austria's government and left Schönbrunn Palace for the last time. And we'll get on to the war and to the collapse of empire later on in the evening. But first of all, if I could ask you to perhaps begin at the beginning (laughs) and tell us something about Wittgenstein's extraordinarily wealthy, cultured and complicated family. Sure. Uh, Well... Wittgenstein came from a Viennese family and it was, as Bethany says, extraordinarily wealthy. Um, His father, Karl Wittgenstein, uh, virtually owned the iron and steel industry in the Habsburg Empire. Um, And the Wittgensteins owned uh, a lot of homes, the chief one of which was the Palais Wittgenstein, um, which no longer stands, unfortunately. Uh, Where it once stood, there is now a multi-storey car park such is progress uh, but the, 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 the house was fabulous as you can see from this grand staircase and the red salon uh, the, the Wittgenstein family were not only very wealthy they were also very accomplished um, and Karl Wittgenstein had very high expectations of his children particularly of his sons Ludwig Wittgenstein was the youngest of eight uh, five boys and three girls And this this photograph here on the right uh, shows all the siblings. Um, And there was a great... Partly because of the tension between uh, the children and Carl's austere and unbending expectations of them, the family experienced great tragedy. So the oldest boy here, Hans, uh, was a a, a musician of extraordinary ability, uh, of... Mozartian proportions. He was a child prodigy. He was writing concertos at the age of seven. And he wanted a career in music, but Karl wanted him to go into the iron and steel industry. And Hans reacted to that by running away, uh, and he committed suicide in, in America. Uh, his body was found in Chesapeake Bay. Then the second son, uh, hiding in the shadows there, is Rudolf, Rudy. Uh, who was gay and who wanted a, a, a career in the theatre. Um, and again, Carl you know, wanted him to, to, to go into the iron and steel industry. Uh, Rudy ran away to Berlin um, and committed suicide in a very theatrical way. He went into a, a bar, ordered two drinks, put, put the drinks down on a table, had the pianist sing a sad love song uh, and um, swallowed some poison. Um, the third son who is Kurt there, happened also to commit suicide, although not in such a uh, dramatic or tragic way as Hans and Rudolf. Uh, Kurt Wittgenstein killed himself at the end of the First World War when the troops under his command refused to, to, to obey him and he felt that he uh, had to end his own life. So Ludwig Wittgenstein grew up in this extraordinary family um, 
where much was expected and where, you know, they had all the advantages of being extremely well off, but also the disadvantages of being very highly strung. And when he was young, uh, his two older brothers, Hans and Rudolf, had already committed suicide. If I could just uh, ask a little bit about that, that suicide, how did that hang over Ludwig? Well, thoughts of suicide were never very far away from Ludwig. Actually, I mean, throughout his life, he was all, you know, constantly saying, I'm on the brink of suicide. Now, you know, a lot of people say that sort of thing, and it's hyperbole. They don't really mean it. Um, I think it's quite clear, given the, given the background that Ludwig was from, that when he said he was close to suicide, uh, and he said it often, uh, he meant it. He, he, he really was. Um, so the effect of the suicides was to actually relax the regime of uh, the Wittgenstein family with regard to the two young, youngest boys, Paul and, and Ludwig. Um, I'll just skip that. And, and Ludwig was actually sent to school. The other boys were educated privately, but Ludwig was sent to school. And I, it's a mystery to me why this particular school, it's a very undistinguished school in Linz, um, famous only for one thing, which was that it was also the school of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler and Ludwig Wittgenstein were born within days of each other. Um, They didn't see one another much at school because Hitler was a year behind and Wittgenstein was a year ahead. Uh, But they did attend the same school. Now, the Wittgenstein family were were right at the centre of all the cultural life in Vienna. Um, Karl Wittgenstein paid for the secession building here which was used to uh, exhibit the work of the Jugendstil artists, uh, Egon Schiele and Gustav Klimt. And Klimt painted this rather beautiful portrait of uh, Ludwig's sister, uh, Margareta, who was called Gretel. And Gretel was very close to Ludwig. Of all his siblings, she was the one who was closest to him. Uh, and really, when he was growing up, he didn't really receive his education at the Real Schule in Linz. He received his education at home, primarily from Gretel, um, who was always on top of the latest intellectual and cultural uh, uh, currents. If I could ask about some of those intellectual currents, mm. who would be the figures in that hothouse that was Fin de Siecle Vienna? Who influenced Wittgenstein? Okay, so there are a number of key ones. One, of course, is Freud, um, who was, a, you know, who was then inaugurating the psychoanalytic movement. Uh, Gretel was psychoanalyzed by Freud and was was a, was a friend of Freud's. And Wittgenstein grew up just just being, you know, from the family he was and having the sister he had. He just grew up with, with, with Freudian ideas as part of the, the wallpaper, so to speak. Um, and he surprised some of his friends at Cambridge by describing himself as a disciple of Freud, um, which is not how most analytic philosophers see him. And then, uh, in a different kind of area, Karl Krauss, um, uh, who, who, who was for the Wittgensteins, particularly for Gretel and, and Ludwig, the sort of conscience of Vienna, you know, the the one who told the truth about uh, the corruption in, 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 in the, the uh, last days of the Habsburg Empire, uh, who opposed the First World War, and so on. And somebody who, for whom language... Uh, langu- was in- purity of language, precision of language, and that was a, a great lesson that Ludwig learned. And then in music, um, this, this, oh, this room here, the music salon... Uh, was uh, in the Palais Wittgenstein and Brahms was a regular uh, attender of, of parties at the, the house and many of Brahms's uh, chamber works received their first performance at the house and in that, in that very room. Josef Labor owed his career to the Wittgenstein family. Karl Wittgenstein was Labor's uh, patron. So Wittgenstein grew up with uh, music, literature, intellectual ideas always at the cutting edge. Um, now, here's two people that we should talk about, uh, Weininger and Schopenhauer, both introduced to Ludwig by Gretel. Um, Schopenhauer uh, enjoyed a great vogue among Viennese intellectuals at that time. His metaphysics in the world as well as representation gave a sort of spin on Kant's theory in the Critique of Pure Reason, 
where Kant distinguished the phenomenal world from the noumenal world, the world as appearance and the world as in, in itself, Kant said that we can't know anything about the world in itself. Schopenhauer's sort of gloss on that, his version of that, is that we can and that the world in itself is actually the world of our will. So for Schopenhauer, the, two, uh, the contrast is not between appearance and reality, but between things that we represent to ourselves and things that we bring about by ourselves through our will. And Weiniger, um, far more controversial. Weiniger's far more controversial and, and unknown, actually, in the English-speaking world. Um, but he published this book called Sex and Character, uh, published in 1903. And it's a, it's a mad book. Wittgenstein at Cambridge would recommend this book to his friends and they would read it and be really puzzled as to why he'd recommended it. Um, because, it, well, the, the, the views, I'll just briefly outline the views expressed in Sex and Character. The idea is, uh, the heart of the idea is that men and only men should work to realise and do justice to the genius that they are capable of. Women, according to Weininger, are not capable of any kind of genius. They're just, they're a kind of lost cause intellectually uh, and, and therefore ethically as well. Uh, women can't be trusted to tell the truth and they can't be trusted to think either. According to Weininger, women don't think in ideas. They think in what he calls henids, which are pre-conceptual uh, ideas. And women look to men to articulate their ideas for them, according to Weininger. Uh, now, women are of no import morally. Uh, it's only men. And another twist to this uh, story of, uh, of, of Weininger's is, is that Jews are a kind of woman, and so Jews are a lost cause intellectually and morally also, and so are homosexuals. Now, Weininger himself was both Jewish and homosexual, and so he, on his own theories, uh, could not do what was the only ethically serious thing that anybody could do, and in accordance with that, he, he committed suicide in a, in a in a way as dramatic as, as Rudolf's suicide, uh, he went into Beethoven's house here in Vienna, walked up to the mantelpiece and shot himself. Now, I, when I wrote my book, I was really puzzled why Wittgenstein admired Weininger, given that the, the book is so crazy. And it was when I saw this phrase here, logic and ethics are fundamentally the same. They are no more than duty to oneself. That seems to me, I don't think Wittgenstein was at all influenced by all this nonsense about Jews and homosexuals and, and, and that. But I think he was influenced by this idea that um, there are basically two things that are worth doing in life. One is thinking clearly, the other is behaving decently. And the idea that those two are really two sides of the same duty, which is why I called my book The Duty of Genius. The duty of genius is the duty to do two things. It's the duty to think as clearly as you possibly can and to behave as well as you can. Encapsulated in that remark of Weininger's, logic and ethics are fundamentally the same, no more than duty to oneself. And he then goes from this rather undistinguished school in Linz uh, to, study, to Manchester to study aeronautics. But how did he make the jump from aeronautics to philosophy? Okay, so uh, he, went to, he went to Berlin first, studied engineering at Berlin, then in 1908 came to Manchester, which was at the cutting edge then in aeronautical engineering, which is what Wittgenstein <coughs> wanted to specialise in. And these are the very early days of aer aeronautical engineering. Um, you know, the, the heady early days of, of, of manned flight. Uh, he started by flying kites in, in Glossop. And the way he went from there to philosophy is quite interesting because it's actually duplicated in the novel The Man Without Qualities uh, by uh, Robert Musil. And the way it works is this. Wittgenstein was interested in engineering. He wanted to design an aeroplane. And his particular design had this form. He, 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 he wanted to use the energy from jet propulsion to turn the blade around, rather like the, 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 the force of water turns a, a water sprinkler around. Um, and he became very interested in the design of the propeller. Now, the design of the propeller is essentially a mathematical task. And so he became, he, he, his interest shifted gradually from, from engineering to mathematics. He started attending lectures in Manchester on mathematics. Then the next step was to become interested in 
what mathematics is. In other words, the philosophy of mathematics, what numbers are. Um, the way this, this occurs to, to, to philosophers, and Wittgenstein always said that philosophical thoughts occurred to him. He didn't go, as it were, looking for them. They, as it were, attacked him, and he, you know, and he couldn't rest until he solved the problems. Well, in, in mathematics, we're dealing all the time with, with numbers. And then when we stop to step, step back and say, well, what are numbers? It's one of those philosophical questions that the more you think about it, the less certain you, you, you are about the, the answer. And one person who published a very influential answer was the philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell at Cambridge, who in 1903 had published The Principles of Mathematics, which gave a very clear answer to the question what numbers are. Numbers, according to Russell, are classes, uh, what some mathematicians call, call, call sets. But Russell, as soon as he finished writing the first draft of Principles of Mathematics, discovered a problem right at the heart of his theory, uh, known as Russell's Paradox. And Wittgenstein became gripped with the idea of solving that problem. Russell published the book in 1903. He put forward this idea that mathematics is just logic, together with the, what seems to be a fundamental objection to that theory, uh, which is that it's contradictory. And so Wittgenstein came to Cambridge obsessed with the idea of solving that problem and particularly obsessed with the idea of solving the problem of what logic is. Russell had thought about what mathematics is. Wittgenstein was thinking primarily about what logic is. We, we, we have logical relations between propositions. What are those logical relations? And Wittgenstein came to think that uh, at the heart of logic is language and that really the task of the f philosopher is to understand our language. It was quite a, a struggle for him, though, to take on philosophy. Didn't he need to have the assurance that he was good at it from Russell? Yeah, it was a very odd way into it, because when he went to Cambridge in, in 1911, he, he arrived in the autumn of 1911, he hadn't done what most people do, which is apply to Cambridge. You know, he just took the train from Manchester, started following Russell about. Um, and... Um, and Russell wasn't sure at first whether he was mad or a genius. Uh, he, he was one or the other. You know. uh, he wasn't your standard student. And he'd read almost no philosophy. He, had, he hadn't had any formal training at all in philosophy. He hadn't read Aristotle, he hadn't read Plato. He'd read Russell and he'd read Gottlob Frege, the German mathematician come philosopher. That's really all he'd read. Um, and the extraordinary thing is that within uh, less than a year, in the summer of 1912, when Wittgenstein's sister Hermina went to Cambridge, Russell said to her, we expect the next big step in philosophy to come from your brother. So going to Cambridge was seminal in many ways. Yeah, and I think Cambridge is more or less the only university in the world that would have put up with Wittgenstein. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have got through the door here in Vienna, um, <laughs> you know, not having read any philosophy. Uh, and Oxford wouldn't have um, taken kindly to him either. I think, I mean, all came, you know, to, came, to, 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 to the massive credit of Cambridge, all they wanted, all the authorities wanted, was Russell's good word. Was Russell saying, yes, you know, uh, he didn't have to produce any, he didn't have to sit any exams, he didn't have to write any essays. All that was required was Russell saying, yes, he's, he's a clever chap. <laughs> and then, you know, within less than a year, he's one of the leading philosophers at Cambridge. It is the most extraordinary story. Now, while he was at Cambridge in his first year, he fell in love, with, Wittgenstein was gay, and, and, and he fell in love with this man, David Hume Pinsent, who was a mathematics undergraduate at Cambridge. Um, what they had in common was music. Uh, Pinsent was a very gifted musician um, and Wittgenstein took Pinsent on an extraordinary horse riding holiday in Iceland uh, and then another holiday in, in Norway and then he decided that he was going to move to Norway um, Bertrand Russell in his autobiography remembers this conversation Russell said when, when Wittgenstein came to him and said, I'm, I'm going to move to, 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 to a hut by the side of a Norwegian field in the middle of nowhere. Russell said, uh, he said, I, I said it would be dark. And he said he hated daylight. <laughs> <laughs>
I said it would be lonely, and he said he prostituted his mind talking to intelligent people. I said he was mad, and he said, God preserve him from sanity. God certainly will, Russell added. <laughs> but he seems to have had this sort of extreme bent for isolation and, and for sort of radical transformations. And also I think he, he you know, that it's very telling that phrase, he said he prostituted his mind talking to intelligent people. For a lot of us, I think the experience of being at Oxford or Cambridge surrounded by very gifted, intelligent people is a sort of um, stimulating, you know, intoxicating experience. For Wittgenstein, quite the opposite. He felt seduced by it. He felt that he was being distracted. Remember, he's taken from Weininger this idea that the only thing worth doing is producing a work of genius. So for him, and he, he, he used this phrase to Russell many times, and Russell was very alarmed by it, Wittgenstein would say, he'd rather die than not produce the greatest work of philosophy ever written. Um, very stark, you know, either death or a great work of philosophy. And he felt that at Cambridge, I think particularly because he'd fallen in love with, with, with Pinsent, um, he felt that the, 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 the social relations with these clever young undergraduates were getting in the way of the kind of concentration that he required to, to, to work on philosophy. Including the relationship with Pinsent as well. Was that yeah. a, an obstacle? I think him? so. Mm. I, I, perhaps even the main obstacle. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he went to Norway. He lived for a year, 1913 to 14. And he often said later on in his life that that was the year when his mind was most alive. That was when he was doing his best work. Um, and he, he concentrated on the questions of logic that Russell had, so to speak, bequeathed to him. Um, and he came to think that to understand logic, one had to understand language, and particularly one had to understand the limitations of language. So he felt that where Russell had gone wrong, and why Russell had you know, enmeshed himself in contradiction, was that he hadn't understood the limitations of language. He hadn't understood that there are some things that cannot be said. And this was, was uh, originally applied to, by Wittgenstein just in the area of logic, a distinction between those things that can be said and those things would have to be shown. And for Wittgenstein, it was a mistake to try and do what Russell and Frege had done, which is to construct a theory of logic. Because Wittgenstein thought that you can't have a theory of logic because logic permeates our language. We have to see logical relations. You can show that two propositions are logically connected, but you can't say that they are because the, f the logical form that allows us to draw an inference of one proposition from other propositions is at the heart of language itself. You cannot possibly say anything that doesn't presuppose the logical form. So trying to have a theory of logic is a bit like trying to jump on your own shadow. You're never going to do it. Your shadow is always going to move away from you. And likewise, you're never going to put into words what it is that allows you to put anything into words. And that was the, the thought that he'd had at, uh, in Norway. But which he struggled to write at yeah, that point. Yeah, hmm. yeah. He, he kept manuscripts, and those, some of those manuscripts have survived, and they've now been published. Um, but another technique he used was um, to dictate to G.E. Moore. G.E. Moore was then, had replaced Russell as the most fashionable, famous philosopher at Cambridge. Uh, and Wittgenstein, such was his you know, belief in himself, um, used Moore as basically his secretary. You know, Moore, Moore, you know, it wasn't easy to get from Cambridge to uh, this field where Wittgenstein was. Uh, Moore made the trip, and his reward was to, um, uh, to have Wittgenstein's work dictated to him. And Moore then went back to Cambridge with a copy of these remarks, um, uh, which have now been published. And you can see how much of Wittgenstein's first philosophical work, which was not published until after the war, the part that's about logic and logical form and the structure of the proposition had all been worked out by Wittgenstein in, in Norway. And then he goes in the summer of 1914, comes back to, to Austria for a holiday, and the First World War breaks out. And his reaction, uh, I'll just flick onto that uh, slide there. His reaction when war broke out in the summer of 1914 was to immediately to enlist. 
And the reason, it, it wasn't that he was particularly patriotic, it wasn't that he, you know... He didn't thought, even need to enlist. No, he? no, he was, he, he, he could have, um, I, I mean, he could have been, he was uh, exempt on, on medical grounds uh, because he'd had a hernia and... and, and so he, he, didn't need, he certainly didn't need to enlist. He, he volunteered for... The reason he volunteered is that while he was at Norway, while he spent that year living alone in Norway, he read this book on the left here, William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, and he was enormously impressed with it. Now, Wittgenstein, up until that point, was an atheist. He had no religious belief at all. His family were Jewish, but he'd been brought up as a Catholic, but not as a... You know, he, he didn't really subscribe to uh, uh, Catholic beliefs... But he read the varieties of religious experience and was very impressed by stories of, of, con of conversion experiences. And what seemed to be common with a lot of the stories that William James had collected, William James went interviewing people who'd had a conversion experience to, to write this book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And common to the stories of people undergoing an intense conversion experience was the experience of facing death. And Wittgenstein wrote to Russell saying that he'd read this book and that it had a tremendous effect on him and that he thought it was helping him to become a better person. All the time, you must remember these two obligations, these two duties that, he, that, that Weininger's remark uh, uh, encapsulates the duty to think clearly and the duty to be a better person, the, the duty to, 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 to behave decently. Wittgenstein thought that varieties of religious experience helped him to become a better person and inspired by it, he thought that the experience of facing death would make him a deeper, uh, better person. And so he, yes, he enlisted in the army. Just to ask about that, so it, it almost appears that his view of the First World War was, it was a very personal matter. It wasn't the big patriotic, nationalistic, <coughs> political understanding of war. It was something about his own yeah. transformation. Not patriotic at all. He, Wittgenstein kept, um, kept manuscripts while he was uh, a soldier in the First World War. And one of the remarks is particularly telling about the war. He says, look, we, we can't win. We, Austrians, can't win. He said, because we're up against the British, the, the greatest race in the world, he says. Um, uh, so he, he certainly wasn't patriotic. Actually, he, you know, he, 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 uh, he was convinced that the British would win. Uh, but that, for him, as you say, wasn't the point. The point was that he would emerge as a better person, a person who'd... Un a, a more serious person, uh, because a person who'd undergone you know, quite literally life or death experiences. So was there any of the sense that you get from reading other intellectuals at the time, people who greeted the outbreak of the war as the sort of cleansing change that everything needed? For him, it was personal. Yeah, uh, but, but there, you're right, there, there was a lot of greeting the war. But Wittgenstein didn't do that. He, he wasn't the kind of person who was, you know who's going to mill about in crowds, throwing his hat in the air because he was so pleased that we'd gone to war. That, that wasn't his attitude at all. It was, it was sombre and serious. Um, uh, and, as you say, personal. Yeah. Um, he enlisted in, 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 in the Austrian army, and for two years he didn't get his wish, actually, to face death. Um, the Austrian authorities reasoning that he was a member of the Wittgenstein family and that they didn't want to put a member of the Wittgenstein family in the line of fire kept him in um, safe places. And so uh, for the first two years of the war, there was continual misunderstanding. Wittgenstein kept applying to be moved, i.e. to be moved where the fighting was. The authorities thought he wanted to be moved even safer and so kept moving him further back behind the lines. He served for, for the first part of the war... Uh, on this boat, uh, the Kaplana, uh, on the Vistula River um, in Galicia, uh, his regiment uh, was stationed at Krakow. Um, and when on land, he went into a bookshop, and the bookshop only had one book, which was Leo Tolstoy's The Gospel in Brief. And he bought this book, and it had a profound effect upon him. Um, 
it had, one might say, a, a conversion effect upon him. He became known to his fellow soldiers as the man with the Gospels. He, he was never seen without this book in his hand. He read it and reread it, knew it off by heart. Um, and, it, and, and you can see in, in, in his manuscripts um, constant exhortations to God to help him. Now, what's interesting about the first two years of the war with regard to that is he kept manuscripts and he would carry on writing philosophy just like he did in Norway into his manuscripts. And he wrote his philosophy in normal handwriting. Then when he wrote about God and about himself and about his family and these personal remarks, for example, the remark I quoted about the British, that would be in a code that he'd learnt from Gretel. Uh, very simple code where uh, A equals Z and B equals Y and he'd had such experience of writing this code as a child that he, he, it came very quickly to him. Um, and the point of the code was that you know, somebody looking over his shoulder couldn't see immediately what, what, what he was writing. But then in 1916, when he finally gets his wish to go to the Russian front, the, you know, where experiencing death was a daily occurrence, um, and he arrived at the Russian front just when the Brusilov offensive was at its height, um, and he himself was, was um, given medals for valor, uh, three medals for valor. He, he was an extraordinarily brave soldier. Um, but something extraordinary happened in 1916, which is that in his manuscripts, he's writing about logic and the nature of the proposition. Suddenly he writes this, what do I know about God and the purpose of life? And he answers, to believe in a God means to understand the meaning of life. To believe in God means to see that the facts of the world are not the end of the matter. The solution to the problem of life is to be seen in the disappearance of the problem. Isn't this the reason why men to whom the meaning of life had become clear after long doubting could not say what this meaning consisted in? Now, the amazing thing about those remarks is that they're not written in code. It's as if now they're part of his philosophy. So his philosophy until 1916 had dealt with the most abstruse and technical problems of, of logic that, that Russell and Frege had, had dealt with. And in thinking about those problems, he distinguished what we can say from what has to be shown. And now he's thinking about God and he has remarks about ethics and aesthetics and the meaning of life. And he applies that distinction to those areas. So he'd previously said that logic is inexpressible. We can't put logical form into words. He now says, we can't put the meaning of life into words. We can't say anything about God. We can't use language to say anything meaningful about ethics or aesthetics. So all these things now join logic as belonging, as it were, to the ineffable, to the those things that, we, that, that language is not equipped to, to, to deal with. And... Bit by bit, the, the book takes shape during the second half of the war. Previously, it had been a book all about logic. Now, when it's finally finished, and it was finished uh, when he was taken prisoner on the Italian front, um, after the, the, the Russian uh, collapse, uh, he was moved over to the Italian front. He was taken a prisoner by, by the Italians. He finished the book, actually, in the prisoner war camp in Monte Cassino. And in its final version, it's a unique combination of logical theory and mysticism. Which wouldn't have occurred if he hadn't been on the front facing death. And interesting as well, of course, his brother, <coughs> in the first month or so of yeah. the war, loses his arm, which yeah. is something, again, he was incredibly aware of the vulnerability yeah. of yeah. mankind in that That's war. right. It, his brother Paul um, was actually a c cavalry officer. I mean... Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, enlisted as a private um, in an artillery regiment and eventually he was, he, he was such a good soldier that he was sent away for officer training so he finished the war as a lieutenant um, but his brother Paul began the war as a lieutenant uh, in a very smart cavalry regiment um, and he was shot on horseback in fact um, and he lost his right arm he was a concert pianist and remarkably 
carried on his career as a concert pianist with only his left arm. Um, some of the greatest composers of the day, Benjamin Britten, Ravel, wrote concertos for the left-handed pianist, uh, especially for Paul Wittgenstein. Um, and of course, Kurt Wittgenstein died uh, on the battlefield in 1918. There's a remarkable photograph uh, taken just before Kurt killed himself when Wittgenstein was home on leave. Powell had, 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 had uh, left the, the, the army because of his, because of his injury. Uh, but Kurt and Ludwig are both there in uniform. Uh, Paul Wittgenstein is there with his missing right arm. They're all sitting around the, the Hochreit. Um, and you just sort of feel that, you know, this, they're, they're representatives of a way of life that the war has ended. And Wittgenstein clearly felt that. He, he felt that the war had ended the culture in which he grew up. He wore his uniform for many years after the war, as if to say, well, you know, I'm clinging on, as it were, you know, clinging on to what had been. It was the, it was the uniform of an empire that disappeared. Uh, after the war, there was no more Habsburg Empire, there was Austria, um, a country, you know, about the size of Wales. You know, before that, it had been a, a huge and important imperial power. Now, he... The Tractatus, Tractatus, takes shape in those last years of the war. He writes the, the final version shortly after he hears about the death of David Pinsent. Yeah. And the, the final touches are being put together while he's in the prisoner of war camp. So he wanted to have this experience of facing death, mm. the change, and that comes through in the Tractatus, which makes it an entirely different book than what he would have written before yeah, the war. Yeah. How was it, how did it go down? Well, he himself felt that nobody understood it. Um, because it is this mixture of logical theory and mysticism. Now, while he was training as a, have we got a picture of Paul Engelman there? Paul Engelman uh, befriended Wittgenstein in the last year of the war when he was uh, trained as, a, as an officer. And Paul Engelman was a, had trained as an architect and had, had worked actually as uh, Karl Krauss's secretary and so was steeped in the, the literature that had shaped uh, the Wittgenstein family and shaped Ludwig Wittgenstein, but knew nothing at all about maths or logic. Now, Engelman wrote a really insightful memoir of Wittgenstein in which he recounts the conversations they had in the last year of the war about the inexpressible, about that which we cannot say. So Engelman understood the mysticism deeply in the Tractatus, but had no understanding of the logic. And after all, the logic forms about five-sixths of the book. Whereas Bertrand Russell was profoundly impressed with the logic but thought, thought the mysticism was nuts and, and, and had no time for it at all uh, and was shocked by it, actually. He, when Russell met Wittgenstein after the war, he wrote to his lover, Ottilie Morrill, said, Wittgenstein has become a complete mystic. And he was, he was appalled. Um, and when there's, an, there's a wonderful exchange of letters between Russell and Wittgenstein with Russell trying to understand the Tractatus. And Wittgenstein, you know in a rather sort of querulous, irritable sort of way, explaining all the points. And then eventually he says to Russell, look, you haven't got hold of the main contention of the book, which is the difference between what can be said and what has to be shown. And that was the part that Russell had no time for. Um, so Wittgenstein thought that it, you know, the, the, the book hadn't been understood. It had a great influence among philosophers. Uh, here in Vienna, with the Vienna Circle, and at Cambridge... Um, but among philosophers, the parts that Paul Engelman understood were ignored. Um, Do you think it was easier for somebody from the Viennese yeah. background to understand than, say, the, yeah. the British? Yeah, and, and, and I think Wittgenstein felt that too, um, that there was a cultural barrier between himself and, and British people, much as he admired the British as the greatest race in the world. 
Um, he, he did feel that. And, and it was because his culture was Viennese. The music, the literature, uh, the intellectual life, the, the, the things that people worried about. They worried about, you know, uh, ornamentation. The, the, he admired the, the uh, architect Adolf Loos because of his rejection of excessive ornamentation. Uh, and the importance of that to Wittgenstein wasn't felt by his British friends. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big deal. British intellectuals didn't agonize about ornamentation or not. Um, so there was, a, there was a, a strain of thought, a strain of culture that's very much Viennese um, that Wittgenstein felt his British friends didn't understand. But equally, of course, he'd gone to Britain. And the reason he'd gone to Britain, as I said, Cambridge was the only university in the world that would have, you know, promoted him as a philosopher. And so there was a, you know, just as there was a side of Wittgenstein that the British had no access to, there was a side of Wittgenstein that only the British had no access to. And so there, there was a great division in that, in that respect. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the concept of the unsayable. Yeah. Something which, you know, is extremely challenging for those perhaps not of a philosophical yeah. bent. Yeah, so the inexpressible. This is what Wittgenstein says in, in the Tractatus itself. He says, there are indeed things that cannot be put into words. They make themselves manifest. Now, Engelman, as I said, found this idea familiar and congenial and sent Wittgenstein a poem uh, called Count Eberhard's Hawthorne. And here's the poem, and I'll, I'll just read it out. Count Eberhard Russell Beard from Württemberg's fair land, on holy errands steered in Palestina's strand. The while he slowly rode along a woodland way, he cut from the hawthorn bush a little fresh green spray. Then in his iron helm the little sprig he placed and bore it in the walls and o'er the ocean waste. And when he reached his home, he placed it in the earth where little leaves and buds the gentle spring called forth. He went each year to it, the count so brave and true, and overjoyed was he to witness how it grew. The count was worn with age, the sprig became a tree, neath which the old man oft would sit in reverie, the branching arch so high, whose whisper is so bland, reminds him of the past and Palestina's strand. Okay, so that's the poem. Now, Engelman sent it to Wittgenstein as an example of not trying to utter the unutterable. And here's what Wittgenstein said in response. He said, this is how it is. If only you do not try to utter what is unutterable, then nothing gets lost. But the unutterable will be unutterably contained in what has been uttered. So how does this apply to that poem? Well, the poem just tells in a very simple way the story of Count Eberhard uh, picking up the sprig, it growing into a hawthorn tree, he sits under the tree. It doesn't attempt to put into words what's important about that. It doesn't attempt it doesn't to say, explain. It doesn't explain and it doesn't attempt to say what this meant to the Count. But Wittgenstein and Engelmann felt precisely because it doesn't attempt to do that, it succeeds in doing it. And so in Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Wittgenstein put forward the idea that uh, logic, ethics, aesthetics, the meaning of life, religion, in all those areas, there were indeed truths which could not be put into words, and we had to, as it were, see them. Now, philosophers have resisted this idea. Um, from the very beginning, the Vienna Circle were tremendously impressed with Wittgenstein's logical theory, which they took to, to mean, to, to be this, that there are limits to meaning and traditional philosophy exceeds those limits. Therefore, for, for, traditional philosophy should just, as it were, be thrown into the metaphysical wastebasket, as it were. Um, one of the Vienna Circle, Otto Neuer, the very last sentence of the Tractatus is uh, Proposition 7, says, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And one of the Vienna Circle philosophers, Otto Neurath, echoed that, but put their twist on it and said, we must indeed be silent, but not about anything. And that's the difference between Wittgenstein and the Vienna Circle, that 
For Wittgenstein, as he says about art, in art it is hard to say anything that is as good as saying nothing. Um, For Wittgenstein, it's not that that which we cannot say is just nonsense, worthless. He applies, as it were, a reverential attitude to it. He, when he tried to get his book published after the, after the war, he had a lot of problems getting it published uh, because... It, Karl Krauss's publisher rejected Ka- it. Karl Krauss's publisher rejected it. Otto Weininger's publisher rejected it. Uh, Frege's publisher rejected it. Yeah, it's, it's very striking that he went in that order. You know, he most wants Krauss's publisher, then Weininger's, then Frege. Um, they all rejected it because it's really hard to understand. Um, not least because of its style. For those who haven't looked at Tractatus, it's written in this unique style where of numbered propositions. So it begins with proposition one, the world is everything that is the case. And then the next proposition is 1.1. And the next proposition is 1.11. And it's rather like we, we have a system of um, A roads in Britain, you know, where you, you have the A1 and then the road that comes off the A1 would be the A11 and then the A111. Well, Wittgenstein's numbering is like that. 1.1 is supposed to be a comment on one and so on. And it, it makes it even more impenetrable than it would be otherwise. And publishers didn't understand it. The one person who had some understanding of the logic of it was Bertrand Russell. And Russell was prepared to write an introduction, which would guarantee that it got published. And Russell wrote this introduction and sent it to Wittgenstein, first in English, and Wittgenstein wasn't very happy with it. But then it got translated into German, at which point Wittgenstein refused to have it published alongside his work. Um, He wrote this incredibly ungracious letter to Russell, actually, saying, your introduction has been translated into German, and of course all the refinement of your English style has been lost, and nothing survives but superficiality and misunderstanding. (laughs) because Russell didn't emphasize what Wittgenstein wanted to emphasize, which was the importance of the, the unutterable. Um, he wrote, with, so, so the one thing that would guarantee it being published was, and, and actually did, the, when it was published in 1921, Routledge published it in English and in German, together with Russell's introduction. It wouldn't have been published otherwise. Um, but uh, to, um, to, to Ludwig von Ficker, the publisher, he, Wittgenstein sent it to him together with a, a note. Uh, and he, he wrote to von Ficker, look, this, this work really consists of two parts. He says, there's the part that I've written and the part that I haven't written. He said, and precisely the second part is the more important. Mm-hmm. Which is no way to sell a book. <laughs> I wonder if I could ask, when one thinks about the First World War and military experience and the extraordinary danger that he put himself into and his desire to face death. These days, we'd start talking about post-traumatic stress. We'd start... There would be the the, the recognition of, of major transformation. Did he ever regret what he'd put himself through or what he had had to go through? Or did he see it as being the thing that had given him this enlightenment, this, this idea of the, of, of, of the philosophy? Well, here's an amazing thing. No one who knew Wittgenstein remembers him ever talking about the war. Engelman says he never talked about it. His friends at Cambridge after the war said he never talked about it. There's no sign at all that he regretted it, actually. Um, so I, I, I don't think so I mean there's very little to go on here because he, he, he didn't talk about his experience um, what you can see from the manuscripts that survive uh, from the First World War I think is that no he didn't regret it he, he, um, he thought it was a valuable experience he um, his expectations were fulfilled in, in terms of um, doing something serious, and the uh, and the um, the the, the uh, recollections of him by his fellow soldiers, and the reports of him that went to you know um, 
led to him being awarded these uh, medals for valor. Um, they suggest he was wholeheartedly, you know, put himself into his work above and beyond the call of duty. So, no, I, and, and the fact that he wore his uniform for years mm. afterwards, rather than a sense of regret, I think there's a sense of clinging on, you know. There's, there's a sense that what he regrets is not having served in the war. What he regrets is that the world that, and particularly the cultural world, that had, that had produced almost everything that he valued had, had disappeared. It's ironic to think that the man who said he needed to go to Norway and live in complete isolation before the war to come up with his ideas then found perhaps a greater inspiration in the chaos and the, just the physical proximity of other people yeah. during the First World War. Yeah, and in silence, in so many ways. I mean, the silence of, of the inexpressible, the unutterable in, in the Tractatus. But silence in other ways too. Clearly the death of Pinsent affected him horribly. He, he said to Engelman... He died in a plane crash. In, yeah, Pin, Pinsent was... Uh, had trained actually... Pinsent was a mathematician at Cambridge, but uh, he trained as an engineer in the First World War. And his job was to, to, to test aeroplanes. Uh, the sort of horrible irony of Pinsent going back, as it were, the, the route that Wittgenstein had gone. And, um, yeah, Pinsent died uh, on a test flight. Now, clearly, Vic, I mean, when Wittgenstein was, had received, just received the news of Pinsent's death, he's, he's, he's described looking suicidal. And he said to Engelman, Pinsent took half my life away from me. But that's more or less the only thing he ever said. You know, the, the things that mattered most to him were the things he said least about. He, he very rarely spoke about uh, Pinsent. Um, or his brother, Kurt, committing suicide again at the end of the war? Yeah, he didn't talk about that either. Um, and, um, and he didn't talk about, um, you know, the... Uh, he didn't talk much, anyway, about what he saw as the, the, the death of culture. He talked a bit about that uh, later on in, in, in the 30s. Um, and hardly ever spoke of his experiences in the war. It's, a, it's as if this was the death of Pinsent, the experience on, on the Russian front. These were so intense that his only reaction to them was a kind of reverential silence Again, the unsayable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that language is just not adequate um, to, 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 to put into words. And when he went to Cambridge, he, he, so just to finish the story, he, he, he published Tractatus in 1921. He felt that it solved all the problems of philosophy. And so accordingly, he gave up philosophy. And he became a school teacher. And he was a very bad school teacher. He, he, he became an elementary school teacher. And he uh, also gave up all his wealth. He gave up all his wealth. He mm -hmm. gave it to Gretel, most of it, uh, on the grounds that she was already so wealthy a bit more wouldn't harm her. Um, so, and he had no money at all then. And he lived like a, like a monk, as it were. And um, he, was, he was more or less told to stop teaching. And he joined a monastery as a gardener. Um, and then he designed a house for Gretel. Um, here in Vienna, there, there it is on the, on the right. It, it's still standing. Um, and you can see that it's like with Adolf Lewis. It's, it's, it has this very stark quality of uh, uh, being sort of, there's no decoration, no ornamentation. Uh, Gretel reputedly liked it the rest of the family didn't like it at all and he was made professor he, he was made a British citizen um, he tried desperately to finish his uh, the, the, the book that would encapsulate his later thinking and he, he died before he could accomplish that and he gave up his uh, chair at Cambridge spent some time in, in, in Norway and some time in, in Ireland um, and he returned to Cambridge and he, he died in Cambridge. <laughs>
Well, with the uh, coming to the death of Wittgenstein there, I think I may open the floor to some questions. So if anybody would uh, like to ask some questions. Yes, the lady there. Um, it's not the In order to understand Wittgenstein's philosophy. You said that you would have to be Viennese. You would have to be that his, his philosophy was misunderstood by the British and by the other Europeans, I suppose, and that you would have to be Viennese in order to understand it. Is that what you said? I don't think I quite said that. I said that there was the, the, um, the, the two strands of his work um, were very distinct, and one one strand of his work was understa- understandable by Russell. The other, which has, owes much to his Viennese background, uh, was understood by Engelmann. But I don't think I committed myself to the idea that you had to be Viennese to understand it. Well, that's what, okay, at least half of his work, you say, we're talking about philosophical work. Uh, work. Yes. Then I want Because right. Because yeah. We're talking about the discipline, which is yeah. Tradition. Yeah. That, that's why I'm backing away slightly from this idea that, that you have to be Viennese to understand it. I'm just saying that that I mean Bethany raised it. This idea that that the the idea of reverential silence, the idea of being faced with the most important thing and being silent about it is an idea that one finds in a lot of Viennese writing and one doesn't find it in very much British writing. Yes, but when we, when we talk about philosophy, we do not isolate cultures. Yes? Philosophy is a tradition which is uh, intercultural, if you like. And when we talk about, there is no such thing as Viennese philosophy. There is the, in the history of philosophy, we start and we go to Wittgenstein if you want. There is a tradition, there is a discipline which is united by this tradition. Right? Am I right? I think it varies from case to case. I, I think... Because first of all, excuse me, first of all, the ideas of Bertrand Russell, we haven't talked much about it, but they come from Fregen. Uh, basically, Russell was at work trying to Um, well, anyway, I, th- I think what is true is that Russell, what, what, the way Russell put it was that his thinking about mathematics owes almost everything to German mathematicians. Um, before, you, you know the extraordinary story, he, he didn't actually read Frege until he finished the first draft of Principles of Mathematics. Um, the Ger- Get going. The, the story. Sorry? Yeah, can, can we can let him finish his answer, please? <laughs> the German mathematicians that he cites as influences are Cantor, Weierstrass, and, and, and Dedekind. But anyway, there's, there's, there's something right about what you're saying. I, I mean, that, uh, that philosophy is, as it were, transcultural. Um, and Wittgenstein himself said something along those lines late in life. Um, he had this phrase, he said to his friend Rush Reeves, <clears throat> that the philosopher must be a citizen of no country. Okay, so, so there's certainly something in that idea. However, I think there's also something in the idea that Wittgenstein is a product of Vienna, he's a product of Viennese culture, and that some of the things that puzzled his British friends and colleagues about his thinking and about his attitudes to things weren't puzzling to his Austrian and, and Viennese relatives and friends. So I think, and he himself, despite what he says about philosopher being, not being a citizen of any community, um, he himself felt that in Britain, 
there were sides of his makeup, important sides of his makeup, intellectual, personal, emotional, that the British weren't understanding. So I think, I think culture comes into it, but possibly not at the... I mean, so if, if we're talking about, you know, work in mathematical logic, let's say Frege and, and, and Russell, whether the proofs in, 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 in Frege's Grundgesetze or, or whether the proofs in Russell's and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, whether those proofs are valid or not, cannot have anything to do with the fact that they're British or German, right? That's surely right. But I think it would be myopic to extend that to all aspects of, of philosophical writing, because, especially with Wittgenstein, actually, because Wittgenstein put such a high premium on his style. And his style is unique. He doesn't write like any other philosopher I know. The, the nearest that, that I can think of is, is Nietzsche, but there's certainly not a British philosopher you can name that writes anything like Wittgenstein. And I think to understand that, it helps to know something about and to read some of the writers that influenced Wittgenstein and particularly influenced his conception of, of, of good style. Another question over here. Yeah. Right? Which was completely foreign to, to, to someone like Russell. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so, yes, philosophy comes to a certain level. Yes, there are certain things they want to agree on. But actually, I didn't understand that Socrates meant, well, you know, you know, whatever, Socrates, Socrates. Right? Because I don't have to know as to agree. So, there are certain things in Socrates which, which are not available to me, even though I might be able to understand Wittgenstein's philosophies. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the connection. Yeah. And the historical connections are significant. Yeah, and, and as I said, I think it, it varies from case to case. It varies from work to work. I, I, I mean, German mathematicians could understand Russell's principles of mathematics better than most British philosophers. But if you take an essay that's steeped in Russell's own literary and cultural background, like a free man's worship, uh, the people who know... Coleridge and Wordsworth and so on are going to be better placed to understand what Russell's saying in Free Man's Worship than somebody who's not familiar with, with that British literary culture. So I think it varies from, from, from work to work. I, I think there are some things Russell wrote that it really doesn't matter whether you're British or not. And in fact, you know, uh, in 1903, you know, if, 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 you, if, if your background was in German mathematics, you were better placed to understand what Russell was, was, was on about than if you, if you uh, came from, from, from Britain. But particularly where people are drawing on their literary and cultural and artistic backgrounds, then I think um, it, it, it helps to know something about those backgrounds. We had another question at the back there. I've got a feeling I've missed some of what you just said. Uh, were you asking my opinion about a specific idea or a specific work? Yes, about uh, the gospel, uh, Tolstoy's gospel in brief being seen as a work of, um, of, of theism, in a sense. Right. Agnostic theism. Okay. Uh, yes, and, and 
uh, together with this idea of the inexpressible. Yeah. And of course, every religion, or most religions, most major religions have their mystic side. And so it's not confined to um, the mystic elements of the Judeo Christian uh, tradition. A lot of people have seen connections between what Wittgenstein says about the inexpressible and Buddhism, for example, or Hinduism. Uh, there's a mystic tradition in, in, in uh, Islam. So I, th- I think this notion that what's really important cannot and must not be said uh, is, yes, it's certainly there in Tolstoy, and I think it's... it's uh, but I think it's, it's, it's wider than that. I think it's there in almost every mystical tradition. Uh, I would be very interested in your opinion, Professor Bob. There's this problem of self-destruction in the end of the Tractatus. So that we recognize in the end that the sentences of the, sentences of the Tractatus themselves are senseless or unsensical in the view of the Tractatus. What would you say? Uh, how do you see this problem? What, what, was this something happened to the Kirchstein South and in passion and it became a very end? There's a problem concerning this and then he found this metaphor of the story of the river. What Was it just an intention to show us this result? As uh, I think the so called resolute reading of the Tractatus uh, says that it was, this was the, whole, the main purpose of the whole book. How do you see this? Was this more like a problem for him? Okay, so, so some people here might not know the background that's presupposed in that question, which is to do with the, the interpretation of the Tractatus. Um, the so-called standard interpretation of the Tractatus goes like this. Wittgenstein, in that book, articulated a theory of meaning according to which the very, his own propositions are meaningless. And he is aware of that, and towards the end of the book, he compares his own propositions to a ladder which once one has used it to climb up, one kicks the ladder away. That's the standard interpretation. There's a a, a new interpretation uh, that's been much debated in the last 20 years, which says, look, we can't attribute to a great philosopher such a glaring contradiction as that. We must find some way of understanding the book that doesn't uh, uh, ascribe to Wittgenstein uh, such a, a straightforward and, and central contradiction. And so the new so-called resolute reading um, sees Wittgenstein as leading... As, so the, the basic idea of the resolute reading is that Wittgenstein doesn't believe the theory of meaning that he's at, he seems to be putting forward in the Tractatus and that, and that his motive in putting that forward is to sh- show at the end of the book the theory uh, collapsing under its own weight. The point then is that uh, there can be no theory of meaning. Uh, it's a very clever interpretation, but I don't believe it. Um, <laughs> and I think there's lots of evidence that, to show that. What, what, what motivates it? I, I, I mean, one of the adherents of, of this reading is, is my friend James Conant. And I've talked to James a lot about this. And... and, and um, one thing motivating Jim is, is, is that he can't believe that Wittgenstein believed there was such a thing as significant nonsense. But there's lots of evidence to suggest that Wittgenstein believed just that. In his letters to Engelmann, in his manuscripts, um, uh, in his lecture on ethics, um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, that he thought that there were some things which one could say which, as it were, strictly speaking, are nonsensical, but which nevertheless, like the discarded ladder, point to something uh, beyond themselves. And also the other problem that the Resolute Reading has is that when Frank Ramsey, who I mentioned very briefly, pointed out logical flaws in what Wittgenstein had said in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein's response to that in his Some Remarks on Logical Form in 1929 is to try to repair the gaps in the theory that that Frank Ramsey had identified. Well, why would he bother repairing a theory that he never believed in the first place? Another question at the back. I have a question. 
religious education in the Wittgenstein family? Yeah, I, I, I don't know of any. Um, he, um, he would have received some religious education, of course, at school. Um, and the family attended uh, Catholic services every now and again. Um, there are some religious writers that um, made an impression on him later on. Uh, Lessing is one. Haman is, is, is another. Tolstoy, of course. Um, but there's very little to go on here. And certainly from, from, uh, from his upbringing, I think it's impossible to identify any specific religious instruction that he had that, that, that then influenced him in later life. Why did he then get this very strong feeling of guilt? Of guilt? Yes. When you read his diaries, he every second week writes about I feel guilty and I'm so bad and I should become a better, better man and so on. Yeah. You mean in the First World War diaries? Yes. Yeah. I th- yeah, but... I- and there is something religious about that sense of guilt. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. But, of course, one aspect of that is, is not specifically religious. The, the, that's to say, the feeling that there's a gap between how one ought to be and how one is. And this, I, I, this could be driven by a sort of Weiningerian feeling that, that the, the only thing worth doing is thinking and writing at the very highest level. He once shocked Russell at Cambridge. Russell took Wittgenstein to watch Whitehead's son uh, take part in a rowing competition. And it was all very frivolous and so on. And Wittgenstein shocked Russell by suddenly stopping in his tracks and saying, the way we spent the afternoon is so vile, we ought to be dead. (laughs) How much, if I may, how much did that have to do with his hothouse family background? I mean, this sort of extraordinarily pressurised existence in the Allegasse. I I think quite a lot. And I I think also there's that sense that one ought to be doing the very best. So if, 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 if one's writing music, one ought to be Brahms or Beethoven. There's a story that he once told Russell from a biography of Beethoven about somebody arriving at Beethoven's house, knocking on the door, and nobody comes to answer, and then eventually Beethoven comes and he's, sort of, and he's all dishevelled and he's in a terrible state because he's been ripping his hair off. And, 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 and Wittgenstein tells this story to Russell and says, that's how to be. That <laughs> um, uh, that nothing matters except producing works of genius. And on that thought, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed to Professor Ray Monk. There is another event with Ray Monk here in Vienna on the 13th of November in two days' time at the, Wit- at the house there on Wittgenstein and Music. So if you'd like to come along to that, thank you very much. Thank you.